So, Oli, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Will. Great to have you back. It's been two and a half years, would you believe, since we last were having this podcast conversation. Time flies when you're having fun. It sure does. It sure does. So uh, obviously one of the big things that's changed and the regular listeners will know that we've recently rebranded the podcast. So now since the book came out, the podcast is called North Star Conversations. And for people that didn't listen to the episode that I originally did with Ollie, um, we are going to go into his North Star. We're going to find out what's going on. And uh, I know from the original episode that we did was that it was very much a, um, Ollie is very much driven by his North Star. And I know this because of the conversation that we had before. And what I'm going to do just very quickly, because I should have done this beforehand, is I'm just going to, for those of you that are interested and want to go back to listen, episode 119. So if you want to make a note of that, episode 119 is the original episode that Ollie and I did together. So Ollie, great to have you here. Thanks for having me. So let's start. Your North Star. So I refer to a North Star as a mission that you're willing to do for the rest of your life, something that's the equivalent of trying to empty the sea with a spoon. It doesn't necessarily have that destination. What's yours? Well, if anyone's heard the the podcast before, as you said, we spoke about it then, but just to reiterate is that I'm in functional medicine, I'm in health, I'm in nutrition, I'm in in training and, and the health world in general have been since I was finding my certificates the other day, it's 2006. Like some of the people I'm going to the gym with, like, I weren't even born when I started in this, but the big thing that kicked me into that, and I didn't know it at the time, and this is one of the things I think with our North Star is that we're shown what's going to be our North Star a lot when we're younger, but we're not necessarily ready to step into it. And when I was 15, my dad, who was my hero, he was um, sales manager at Caravan Parks, then became manager at Caravan Parks and used to live like quite far away from where I am now in, in Norwich. He was in like Colchester area managing caravan parks and ended up that he was basically working himself into the ground. He had migraines, he had signs of stress. And then um, he wasn't overweight, um, didn't really drink loads, just the occasional drink and stuff like that, but was just always about working. And mm-hmm. he was looking to retire in his mid fifties. Now, when he was 47, he went on a course and had a migraine and went into hospital, had a stroke, and then we had to turn off his life support machine. All the way from Monday to Saturday, we had to turn off his life support machine. And that was 47. And when he was 47, then I was 15. Now, going through your last year at school, like it interrupted a lot of things, but uh, you just think like, why, why would this sort of thing happen? Now, that then led to this journey into being at music college, trying to find my way, and then I found fitness. And that was when I competed in bodybuilding. And I found that like no one, I didn't need to be in a team because I could do this myself. I could have this control, which opened up a whole nother can of worms. But it wasn't until a few years later, I'd worked in the corporate world and then gone back into personal training and finding a thing called functional medicine, which essentially is looking at the symptoms that we have, brain fog, hormone issues, gut issues, and sleep issues, things like that. And then rather than just giving a medication to say, look, this is going to help you sleep. This is going to mean that you stop bloating. Like this, this is going to mean that like you balance your hormones and stuff just by taking a medication. We're going to find lifestyle interventions, nutritional interventions, maybe some supplements to help you deal with that rather than going down that big pharma route. And I was actually working with a guy in Nashville, a guy called Rick Barker. Now this guy was Taylor Swift's first manager And he first messaged me and he said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I know what to do. I need you to tell me to do it. Like we know the power of accountability. And so many people know this with health, right? They they know they need to move a bit more and stop eating so much processed stuff, but we overcomplicate things and then procrastinate. A couple of hours later, he was on the phone and signed up. And then three months later, I'm at his house in Nashville. And we're recording this um, course that we released called the Musician's Health Course. I don't think it's online anymore. That was like 2017, I think it was. And he said, we went down into his kitchen and his 15-year-old daughter, 13-year-old son was there. His wife, uh, Jill, was there as well. He said, look, you've given Jill back what she married 10 years ago. It was like their 10th wedding anniversary. He'd just turned 50. And I, no matter how many times I say this story, we've said this story on the previous podcast. I've probably said it about 
five, 600 times, but I get goosebumps every time because Rick's daughter was there and, and son, as I said, and like, I was 15 when my dad died. I wasn't able to help my dad when it came to his health, being that 15 year old, but I'm now able to put all my efforts into that North star of saying that I want to help parents that know their stress, know they need to do something about their health, help themselves before it's too late. Cause there's there going to go. be that time where it's too late. So your North star is helping parents or people, you know, but yeah. specifically parents because of your own experiences, but help helping parents, um, to um and and i'm sorry i didn't quite catch the exact terminology but to help them with their their health before it's too late yeah but i look at the things that my dad missed i was 15 so he missed me getting my gcse's he he missed me when i was able to actually take him for a pint at 18 he missed me being able to take him for a drive like um missed like me buying football tickets and being able to go to like games with him all that sort of stuff like being able to see his 50th birthday is like all these things, but mm. he wasn't able to be there on my wedding day on my sister's wedding day and walk her down the aisle or because of stress. Now would something else have happened? Yeah, maybe it would have, but that's the thing that essentially killed him seeing like seeing the signs of stress and not doing anything about it. Mm. So that's what I want to help people with. And that's why we're here again today talking about, how you're doing that, the things that people can do, because there'll be people listening to this right now going, mm, yeah, I know that maybe I'm having the headaches. Maybe they are um, not eating the foods that they maybe could be eating. Maybe they aren't doing the exercises. And look, we've all done it. You know, we've all paid people to just give us that accountability because I'm a big believer that we do more for others than we do for ourselves. So just having yes. that person that I've had it before, you know, you've got the person, saying, I don't want to go to the gym, but I don't want to be that guy that has to cancel 10 minutes before I'm doing the gym at 6am or whatever it is. So it's having that. Um, but what, what, what I'm really keen to, cause you, you, there's a couple of things that you said. One of the things was all the symptoms, you know, migraines, all these things are symptoms, but you also said about functional medicine. Cause I'm a big believer in if you treat the cause, the symptoms go. Yeah. What do you find in a lot of instances with highly driven, ambitious people that are parents, you know, or maybe even grandparents? I don't know whether you're working with grandparents because let's face it, in today's day and age, life longevity has an ability to be, or, or life span has an ability to be a lot longer, but it's not just about lifespan, it's about health span, right? Nobody wants okay. to live to 100 years old, but it's been 30 years, like a crippled old person not being able to do anything. Um what what are some of the, the 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 root causes that you tend to find? That is impacting people's health. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. most common things that are coming up, and some of the quick things they can do to to start making changes. I think poor blood glucose management is a big thing. So, like, I see people that have had highly processed diets and having a lot of processed carbohydrates that the, they're craving these foods, and as a result, their energy is up and down throughout the day. As a result of that, they're then grabbing caffeine. As a result of that, their sleep is impacted. Now, there's there's things we can do, like two big things we can do to improve our sleep and blood glucose management. And that is one, eat more protein more consistently. And two, sleep and wake at roughly the same time every day, including the weekends. And I, like those two tips have helped so many people because um, – I regularly hear with people that I sleep 10 hours and I still feel tired um, or like I get afternoon brain fog and we're able to actually lower the amount of time they sleep around seven, eight hours, like being a good time for people to sleep and we're able to improve their productivity as well as a result. Now, what else happens when we do that? They end up getting to spend more time with their family. So these entrepreneurs these business owners these these busy people that have said they've not got time for anything if we take that energy dip that brain fog whatever it is we want to call it out of the equation we end up giving them an hour or two back each day because they're just getting things done quicker mm -hmm. but they're sleeping more and they're able to spend more time with their family which mm -hmm. is priceless mm -hmm. you said protein so mm -hmm. I have, I think you said more protein, you know, protein, 
comes in lots of different forms, but I've more recently found the impact that it has on sugar. So I've been finding that actually by increasing my protein level, so I'm now having, a, I'm sure you've probably got a, a formula that you use, but I basically take my weight in kilograms and double it in yeah. grams is what I'm aiming for. And I don't hit it every day, but I'm aiming for, I'm so much more mindful of than ever before of getting that protein because I found that when I hit my protein daily goals, then I don't have the, the the crazy, crazy sugar cravings that I have had in, in time gone by. Is that just me or is that, do you find that across the board? Yeah, massively, massively. But um, I was diagnosed with autism and it's going through the process of ADHD diagnosis as well. That basically been told you've got it, worked with clients of ADHD and like protein. The trouble with protein, right, is that people look at it as this muscle building nutrient. It's a nutrient for repair. Mm. The only reason it builds muscles is if you then break down those muscles with doing good weight training over a long period of time, it breaks down the tissues and then they grow bigger. But protein is there is to repair our body from the stress that is put through every single day to repair the cells, to repair the tissues. And I do absolutely find that so many people are having low protein. In fact, I've got a note here to say like signs you're not getting enough protein in. And the one thing like that, that was for a reel I've got to record after this. And um, one of the big ones is brain fog, those afternoon energy dips. We, we end up having, we'll go for the sugary things. We'll go to the coffee shop and have like a latte with sweetener and or like syrup and stuff in it or whatever like the, the sugary drink of the season is. And not even realize that that's that's basically what we would have as a meal. Like, yes, you have your your coffees and stuff like that, but I want to eat my food. I want to get my calories where I chew it and work the digestive process. And protein in itself, like people say they struggle to get protein in. And I'm similar to you when it comes to working out what protein we need. If we want to simplify it, I mean, I use what we call an ideal body weight calculator, which is what... Um, you would use like going into hospital if you're having general anesthetic because if someone was morbidly obese and they ended up having enough anesthetic for their body weight they would end up killing them so an ideal body weight calculator works out usually just a little bit less but it's finding that number you can aim for i would say first off for most people if they're having brain fog if they're having sleep issues you just need to eat more protein and if you get to the point where you end up literally like passing wind all the time then you need to pull back on your protein. And I think that that could be one of the simplest ways of doing it. Eat more. And if you find you, you get digestive issues, eat a little bit less. But mm. aiming for around 2% or 2 grams per kilo of your uh, ideal body weight is pretty much where I, I look to, say, start people to target. So mm. I find that sometimes people are getting like 80, 90 grams in a day. And their ideal body weight would say, look, you need to get 150, 160. Now, if we did chuck 60, 70 grams of extra protein in, they're going to have digestive issues. So they work up to it. Mm. Not only that, but doubling their protein per meal or chucking a shake in or snacks in and things like that is going to be a lot to do. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, and it's becoming mindful of it. You know, I, I, for, for me, a couple of months ago, I started doing it. And I, I think back to in years gone by when I actually, I did do it a lot more. Now, what I wasn't realizing I was doing it as much, you know, back in the day when I would have a protein, like a, a smoothie, but I'd put protein powder in it. So I was getting protein early in the morning. And then I was, yeah. and then as time went on, I've played with loads of different stuff. So I was doing intermittent fasting. So I wasn't having breakfast. I was getting to lunch and then I was just having something. And, but, but now really, I'm really trying to focus on the 180 grams of protein a day and it's it's tough sometimes literally before we just started this episode i've just had a, a yogurt that's got 20 grams of protein in it because it's a 20 gram protein snack yeah. rather than just having um an apple which yes it's healthy great but um it, it's it's not got the protein so okay so there, there's a great couple of tips and, and people that may be experiencing the brain fog or poor sleep they can they can look at that um what i suppose i'm, I'm also really keen to know because i know that you're an avid learner Mm -hmm. and 
you love to learn, you're keeping up to date with lots of different things. And what, what I tend to find is the people that are avid learners is because they're applying stuff to themselves. They're constantly evolving. They're learning new stuff. They're developing. And look, you're human. I'm human. We have challenges. We have our own stuff that we're going through. Since we did our last episode two and a half years ago, what's some stuff that's new in your life that you're working with clients on now from your own personal experience? You mentioned autism, because I believe that's a new diagnosis. Yeah, I think autism, I knew about autism before, but I never was officially diagnosed and like, oh, maybe autistic, I may not be. And I always had that thought, oh, everyone's a little bit autistic and everything like that. And then I got the official diagnosis. But I think that's a good place to start with the learning of neurodiversity and how nutrition impacts it. I'd done a post actually and said that, or it was in a talk, I, I was asked about it. And I said, look, if I eat rubbish, I get so bad, such bad symptoms of autism that I do not want to be networking. I do not want to be social. Like I will go, if I'm in a restaurant or something, I'll literally zone into every single conversation apart from the one right in front of me. I'll hear every single noise when someone's chewing their food and it will be exacerbated so much more and things just wind me up. And it's similar like with ADHD, my focus goes all over the show. And it got mm. me looking into how does food actually impact this? And even mm. looking into gut health, how gut health, like it's shown that there's, there's a bacteria called acomancia, and it's shown that neurodivergent ADHD and autism specifically, these people have a lower level of that. So if we can boost that, and boost um, other things like short chain fatty acids. I think that's something called butyrate, which if we look at probiotics, it's the things that probiotics create. So if we can get that in ourselves, it can help your focus. It can help you lower those symptoms. Now, someone obviously got triggered on social media and said, look, if you, um, if you don't have symptoms when you eat different food, then you've not, you're not autistic. I said, I never said I didn't have symptoms. The symptoms were just better. And I think we, we need to be aware, and this is something I've looked at myself, is that we are actually in control of our health. Some things we may think are out of our control, but we can improve our health. I can improve my health now. I'm working on my health, and I've got so much knowledge about my health. It's still a work in progress. And when we think things are completely out of our control, that, that can sometimes allow us to just let, let that go and think we can't improve when actually if we look at the choices we're making you, you can always see like getting your protein in actually those symptoms got worse when i lowered my protein getting your sleep in those symptoms got worse when i started dropping my sleep a little bit or after i went on um, a, a trip to a different time zone or they got worse when the seasons change so there's seasonal affectional disorder so we can use light boxes and things like that to improve how we focus and we have more control than we think and if we focus on those things we can control if you, you write a list of things that we want to improve in on i can't remember who it was that um said about this i think it might have been craig groeschel um christian business guy and he said like if you write this list there's probably only one or two things that you can actually control so focus on the things that you can control and do Child them control, really, really well. Yeah. yeah. Like the other stuff that will happen, it may not happen, but there are more things you can control than you think. And it's taking that accountability, like actually taking that responsibility to control those things, which, which helps. And I, I think that's a big thing over the last couple of years. Also diving into hormones a lot, massively, massively diving into hormones. Before, before we go into hormones, because I just want to touch this, I'm a huge fan of Stoic philosophy. And Stoic yeah. philosophy, there's only three things that we actually can control, which are our perceptions, our actions, and our decisions. That That's yeah. it. You know, everything is out of our control. The, the autism thing, I just want to touch on it in a moment, because neurodiversity is definitely becoming a bigger component of lots of people's lives. Lots of people are talking about certain things. There's arguments in, in relation to to is food uh, a cause i've got my own opinions on that um or, or the cause that creates it i've got my own opinions on that but the um the, the thing i wanted to know is what what was it that made you think because you you must be in your sort of 30s 40s oh, maybe. Yeah. 
Right, 38. So yeah, don't put me in my 40s yet. <laughs> uh, it's the camera. The camera makes you go. Um, the, uh, the, but you, what what was it made you think, do you know what? Yeah, I'm going to go and, like, what symptoms are you experiencing to think, right, I'm going to go and get this diagnosis? And having had the diagnosis, what, if anything's changed for you? I think there, there was a video that I watched and it was someone talking about autism and a late diagnosis. And they explained about how they used to just absolutely love certain things. And um, I used to do it with music, used to do it with video games, used to like just, I would literally have this specialist topic, but I got frustrated that I couldn't do a Rubik's Cube. So I learned to do it in an afternoon. I was like, I'm not going to bed until I actually do this. And I like, took four or five hours to do it. And frustrating now that I can't actually go past the Rubik's Cube and when it's not done and I need to do it. Um, but just seeing these signs like social situations, people all automatically think that because I've spoken in front of hundreds of people, because I've like, I rapped at my wedding, like when I was doing music, I would DJ, I would perform. But social situations, this is one of the ones which did really hit me is that I would go up to a group of people. If we're in a one-to-one, -one, absolutely fine. But if you're in a conversation with five other people and I come up, I'd be like, do I, do I come in now? Do, do I wait? And I'll just stand there awkwardly. And rather than saying like, hey, Will, how's it going? I wouldn't know how to get into that conversation. So I found myself going to social gatherings and at networking events. I would see other people just going around the room, starting a conversation. And I'd just be what I would see as the awkward one Unless I'd spoken at that event, I'd then be talking to every single person. Um, but I would find myself like when I'm in the one-to-one -one side of things, I can speak to everyone all day. And then I would also find myself tired afterwards as well. And I found a thing called masking, how that we learn to adapt when you're autistic. And I believe in ADHD as well. And it tires you out. So I'd been brought up in these social circles. So I'd learned to adapt how I needed to be rather than be myself. And I remember getting the diagnosis and it was a re relatively short diagnosis. I went through Psychiatry UK. They have a thing called right to choose and they refer you to your GP. It's normally a four year diagnosis for autism in adults. Not that it helps being diagnosed because they don't really give you any treatment for it, but I actually had done it in two months, which was ridiculous from sending the letter to my GP to actually having the referral um, conversation. And I cried when they said it because it was just answers. So many questions I had about growing up. Why that everyone loved Leonardo and Raphael and I loved Donatello. Like when it came to like all that sort of stuff, like why I didn't have loads of friends growing up, but I had one or two really close friends and I still have those friends to this day. Like it's, it's just, yeah, I just didn't fit in. It was like this square trying to fit into a circle when you see those kids toys going in there. Mm. Um, and I think they're, they're the signs. However, some of those same influences, and people might get frustrated when, when they hear this, but I see people using these diagnoses as an excuse. I can't do this because I'm autistic or I've got ADHD. And I started falling down that rabbit hole of that oh, I can't travel as much. I mean, I've spoken in America, in Colombia, in Croatia, like places all around the world had clients all around the world. We've, we've followed each other's success over the years, right? And we've, we've seen the success happen. And then all of a sudden, when I was diagnosed, it was like this rug being pulled from under me. Like, oh, I, I don't know how to act in an airport now. Like, what am I going to do with a stranger sitting next to me? And then after a couple of months, I just had to like slap myself and said, look, nothing has changed. You were able to do this before. You've got a name now like for a condition but it's up to you whether you let this condition define you and define your success. I think so many times we can just get just pulled into the way everyone else thinks. But when we're driven, when we want to be successful, we've got to realize what we are actually capable of, regardless of what condition we've got. We've seen people with major, major disabilities, but get ridiculously successful, ridiculously successful. Mm. I think what what you said there is is so key is a label doesn't define you. And yeah. so often it's other people's 
perceptions of what they deem is possible for themselves that they project on other people um, that that then gets in the way of other people going and doing the very thing that they're capable of doing. And and that that's that's super, super powerful. I, I suppose something else that you, you kind of were just leading into was that um, we, we're really going under the cover or under the bonnet, if you like, of the things that you've had to do in your own life, the things yeah. that you've done that have helped you optimize yourself to be at your best. And most people that I find are in the expert space in any area of life, whether it's in relationships, whether it's in health, whether it's in wealth, whatever it is, they're, they're looking to optimize for their reasons, you know, for you, it's for your dad, for me, it's for my dad. Those that, that was one of the driving forces that drives that North star of where the, the the pain, if you want to call it, originates from. But then we've had to apply stuff to ourselves as time goes on as well, right? Yeah. And that's where in, in more recent times, I know hormones have, have played a, a part of yeah. what you've been doing to optimize as well. Yeah, and I think like not enough people talk about testosterone in men. Now, I've, I've put out a lot of con content about women's hormones, and it's not really what I'm going to touch on in the depth here today, uh, but... I've then been belittled for putting out this like talk about perimenopause, about menopause, even though I'm a medical professional with so much experience, but I do feel there needs to be more information about that out there. And also a responsibility for us guys to know what the women in our lives are going through when it comes to hormones. And um, I, yeah, it's just funny how people like will only do it if like they, they don't look at the professional qualifications. They'll just look at a guy talking about it when you're trying to add help. But testosterone is a thing if we look at things like hormone replacement therapy i've seen so much of a negative connotation with male hormone replacement therapy compared to female hormone replacement therapy but when we look at the rates of suicide going up in guys that it's going up and up every single year and we see lifestyle choices lowering testosterone every single year in fact there was a study um that or in fact there was a study i heard about on, I think it was like on Peter Atiyah's uh, podcast talking about testosterone levels, how that in the Western world, if people continue as they are and the decline of testosterone and also sperm count, then by, I think it was 2045, pretty much all the Western world will be infertile and or infertile. And that's a scary statistic. That's 20 years from now that a lot of guys won't be able to do their bit in having a, having a child and it's something which hit me hard because um when i was competing in bodybuilding so and, and people get frowned upon about talking about steroids and stuff like this i done seven shows and the last show i used steroids didn't use a stupidly high amount or anything like that had an eating disorder at the same time so i didn't get the results that people would have got but i know that i could have got to where i am now without that stuff because i've seen people in better shape than me that haven't used anything and as a result, I screwed up my hormones, absolutely screwed them up. Now, in the same aspect of learning about brain function, about migraines, about like stress with my dad, this then pushed me to learn about hormones. And um, I was doing all I can to learn about this stuff. And then I went on testosterone replacement therapy in 2017. And my testosterone was like about six or seven now normal is eight to 29 and the i mean that's 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 i just want to touch on that because that in, in itself is such a broad range and I, I have a real personal strong opinion on normal because hmm. i i don't think like there's a massive difference between normal and optimal for you yes yes and there's a huge difference because optimal for an individual person their normal for them for their body type they think might be 25 to 28 but because it's classed as normal in the yep. sense of oh well i've got 10 but for them to be optimal it would be 25 to 28 it, it has a it has a there's a huge difference and i think that's the that, that that in itself not just in in terms of testosterone but in life in general what's optimal for me and the question, what am I optimizing for? Because just those, what, what, the, well, what am I optimizing for and what's optimal for me? Those two questions are so powerful in any aspect of life. Absolutely. And if we look at like blood markers, like that eight and 29 is like when 
Western medicine would define sickness. Now, say, as you say, you are used to being at 26, 27, and you go to 1718, and you look at that one marker of 1718, oh, it's not your testosterone. But that's where having regular checks, I think a full Medichex blood test, they do now one with APOE, a cholesterol marker in for like 250 pounds. Um, they do an ultimate performance test, which does everything apart from that APOE for like 200 pounds. So you can get one of those at least every year. I get one every six months. And like, you can stay on top of all these things. You can see patterns starting to happen. Like someone may have been at 18, 19 all the time and they feel absolutely fine. And then they start going to like 12. Medically, they're not going to do anything. They just mm. see the symptoms, but also as well. But this is where we have to treat the overall picture. Look at symptoms, look at lifestyle and everything like that, because someone could have clinically low testosterone, but no symptoms. They could have high testosterone or high estrogen, low estrogen, but no symptoms. So if we then start throwing that out of whack, are we then going to create other symptoms that we're then got to deal with? And, and I think... I was going to say, and the other element to that as well is that people have the symptoms, but they put it down to something else. Yeah. yeah I've, I've got the symptoms of I'm not sleeping very well, but it's because I've got a young child. So I'm up all night or whatever else it might be. They don't realize that there's other factors at play. I did a, and, and I'll share this. So I had a, um, a full bloods panel done, uh, I don't know, five, five years ago or so now um, was, was one of the ones that I had done. And I had been taking magnesium every day, pretty much every day for years. Now, magnesium is the fourth most important mineral in the body. You don't produce it. You only get it from foods. I was taking a magnesium supplement every day and I had such low magnesium. It was ridiculous, like off the scale low, but I was taking it every day. So until I got the, if somebody said, oh, well, you might be lying magnesium. I was, no, 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 no chance. Right. Because magnesium is a, is a mineral that we use when you're highly stressed, you use a lot of magnesium. And I, um, I, I was finding myself and I lived a high and still do live a high stress lifestyle. And the, 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 the fact was it was only when I had the blood panel come back and it said it, I was like, wow. And I had to take, I think it was four or eight. I get confused four or eight times the amount of what would be a normal dose of magnesium for 30 days to get back to optimal. And then to maintain optimal, I had to have double the normal average person's amount of magnesium. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's really, I just say, sometimes you put it down to something else, you disregard it, but what you, you can't manage what you don't measure. Yeah. And, and like, this is where testing, like if you don't test, you guess, like we say these things, like what is an RDA, a recommended daily amount? but yours is going to be different to mine, which is going to be different to my wife's or to the next person's. So how do we have this average RDA of like, everyone should have this amount of magnesium. Actually, this person's training five times a week. They're also like an exec in like a massive, massive company. And they've just had twins. So like all that stuff, like they're going to need a little bit more. And they're also like the soil in that part of the country is, from or from the places where they're getting their food is actually even more deficient in magnesium. They're going to need more and more. Hence why like testing this stuff, like you can get nutrient deficiency tests. I use ones with clients called a metabolomics plus, and it tells us exactly where they're at. Like, as you said, like your magnesium was low, but then how is someone's gut health to be able to absorb this stuff? And like all that stuff, we have to then look at the bigger picture of like, well, I don't want someone to be on a load of supplements, but I feel supplements are necessary. I don't want to make my money off like a bulk of supplements, but when people tell me, can you get me healthy without supplements? Is that we probably could long-term if we were really, really obsessive with every single thing. But is that realistic for sustainability? And, and convenience. And convenience, and, and yeah. And convenience, right? Because yeah. you, it's a bit like saying, can I get healthy without eating food? Yeah, you know, it's like the, 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 if you if you looked at supplementation in the form of food, because it, yeah. certain supplements, let's face it, they're, they're the things that are missing from our diet because they're not convenient to have, or yeah. certain foods just don't have the appropriate am amount. It has a big impact. So, so just just to kind of bring it back on track a, a minute, then. In, so you you were focused on your hormone, your 
uh, your testosterone replacement therapy based on stuff that you'd done. You messed up your own hormones yep. years in years gone by. And this is something in even in sort of the last since we had the last episode, last two and yep. a half years that you've been working on in quite a big way, right? Yeah, it's a thing where I thought, well, if I'm having these issues, then definitely other people are. And I'm so focused on my health as well. So there's going to be people that are having these issues that aren't focused on their health and don't know they can do anything about it. But like we then like we were trying to conceive and it turns out my sperm count was really low. And they, they said that we could freeze a sample and, and get the hair, but you're going to have to come off. Now, since then, I've known protocols and I researched it as well, but we, we had to go through um, IVF treatment. And it, it was a case that they would not give us the funding for one round of it unless I came off. And to be fair with the amount of testing, I could have just stayed on and they pretty certainly wouldn't have known and done like different um, protocols to kickstart your sperm count. But they said that you're going to have to be off for a year and that will get your sperm count high. Okay. So I then spoke to some of my mentors now. Um, one of my mentors is a, a lecturer out of Harvard. So looked into all of his content that he'd previously put out and um, I was like, well, he's going to know a lot, lot about this stuff. And we looked deeper into it, started contacting a lot of people that I knew like from the bodybuilding days that have known people that have gone through this sort of stuff. And I worked out a protocol for myself and it took me three months to get my numbers back to the right level to actually be able to freeze a sample. But in that time, um, it took another couple of months to actually freeze the sample with the, the uh, appointments. In that time, my testosterone went from 22 to 1.1. And my estrogen went rock bottom as well. And I think that estrogen is a thing that isn't spoken about enough in guys. We say, oh, we don't want high estrogen. We don't want this or that. But when that dropped, brain fog was just all over the place. I literally could work for an hour or two a day. Not just with that, but the moods were really low. Like I knew that it was temporary. and But I still didn't want to be on this planet. And this is the first time I've spoken about this on on any podcast or anything um but it's a case that we need to get this message out there that testosterone is a big thing for guys it's not just for building muscle it's not just for people that are bodybuilding it's actually there for mental health as well and estrogen like we need it for mental health not just physical health and one of the most frustrating things that i had is that last may june that i was in the best physical and mental shape of my life when i had to come off that trt and like I was in better shape than when I had used steroids at a slightly higher dose for when I competed in bodybuilding, using like physiologically normal levels, like bioidentical levels of testosterone. And then you do every single thing you can do to keep in shape. You do everything you can do to improve your sleep, to manage your stress, but your testosterone is low and you start seeing your body go away. So you get people that are frustrated because they can't get the results in the gym. You get people that are frustrated because they're trying to sleep and they're waking up through the night. They're trying to manage their stress and nothing's working. But if their hormones are out of whack, then it's, it's very much that it's going to be super, super hard to improve your health, to optimize your health. And I think that's an important thing. Like when we talk about optimizing things, there's, there's sickness and there's optimal health as, as we've said about, and like now, like, even then, like get, it took about four years to work with the knowledge I've got and work with specialists to get to the level which was completely like optimal for it. Now, could you tell a younger Ollie to go back and not use anything at all? I already had symptoms of low testosterone before I used anything for bodybuilding purposes. But would that young guy actually listen? And I think that talking about using drugs which essentially is what they are um, and having to overcome the negative results from those drugs. We need to have more people doing that because I'm seeing people that are younger. I was what, 20, 25, 26. Yeah. Something like that. When, when I used them, I'm seeing people in there like 18, 19, 20 because of the, the pressures from like looking at social media, like using these drugs to actually boost their physique when they can get these results without them. And then later on down the line, they're going to have issues like I've had. Turns out it wasn't actually the issue with the sperm side of things. And we're still going through um, 
IVF, we find out in the next few days whether it's been successful. But having to go through that process taught me so, so much, not just about hormones on the male side, but it also um, gave me like just a 10% inclination as to what women go through with menopause. Now, guys go through a thing called andropause, which essentially is lower testosterone from like 30 onwards. It's just lower slowly, hence why we don't get as much of a hit as women do. But women have perimenopause years where they go through menopause and estrogen drop in, body being more inflammatory, uh, testosterone not being there. And the adrenals have to take over because at any time during our lives, 10 to 30% of our sex hormones are produced from our adrenals. And what actually happens is that when they're required to be the, the, the breadwinner, shall we say, with hormones, and they've been stressed out for so many years, we get so many more symptoms. So I speak with clients and they've had brain fog and they're improving their brain fog because we've worked on their adrenal function, not able to sleep because we've worked on their adrenal function that's now improved, not able to lose weight. Now we've worked on their adrenals and doing less in the gym, it's been able to improve all these things. So like that, that's as close as I feel I'm ever going to get to experience in that first hand, that drop of estrogen, that drop of testosterone in such a short period of time. But it's worrying to think what the world is going through when it comes to hormones. In in terms of, um, I'm going to bring this back to your North Star, right? which yep. is help, helping people with this. And obviously you're evolving and you're developing. We're speaking about some of the more recent things that have happened. And I do recommend that people go back and listen to episode 119, which we recorded two and a half years ago. To, to listen to some of the other things that we had had um, been been speaking about then. Knowing what you know now, for the people that are particularly stressed, they may be in their 30s or they're in their 40s right now, aside from hormones and, and testosterone replacement therapy and aside from um, so, some of the other things we've already mentioned, what else do you feel are... Are some of the like obviously treating the cause is is key, but what what do you feel are some of the real common lifestyle changes that people can make today that are listening to this that are maybe thinking, do you know what I I I know something's not right. I know I'm not operating at my best. Maybe they haven't gone and had their bloods done, and maybe they will. We'll talk about how they can do that in a moment. But um, what what are some other really common things that people could start doing today, this week, this month, to start making a difference to feel better? Yeah, I think first off, recognizing that you use the word common. And when we look at symptoms, a lot of us will push off symptoms because it's common. But just mm. because something is common doesn't make it normal. Like waking up during the night to go to the toilet. As guys get older, oh, it's just down to weak bladder, prostate issues, all this sort of stuff. But it's usually a sign of stress and glucose issues, like up and down glucose management. Um if you're waking up without energy, if you're having that brain fog, if, if you're not able to lose weight, if you've got low sex drive, if you've got low drive and moods, all these things, there's loads of symptoms and we push them off because we don't want to deal with it until we absolutely have to. And what we need to look at is we've said about protein. We've said about sleeping and waking at the same time, moving, but looking at the gym, I go to the gym it's a place for me where I've got some good mates there and stuff. It's been a big part of my life. But does everyone have to smash workouts? I definitely don't smash workouts like I used to. Like that, I'm not that Ollie. I'm not that angry guy that I used to be or anything like that. I'm going there. I train for health now, for feeling good rather than abs and like, yeah, like they come, they go, they're here every every now and then. But like, I train for health to feel good. Mm. And I think we have to recognize that this, this might hurt people is that you're not as busy as you think. There's always a way to do it. It's just, we're trying to do too much, which gives us an excuse to why we can't do it all. We don't need to do 75 hard. We don't need to train five times a week. We don't need to go on a really restrictive, extreme diet. We can just do the minimum and do it consistently. So that protein, that sleep, uh, being aware of what you're doing before bed, but looking at screens, um, using blue light blocking glasses. Be aware of what you're watching, like watching some, watching the news, like, or negative things, some like 
murder stuff like dramas and things before bed like how are you going to go to sleep peacefully be aware of how you're waking up waking up and using the snooze button studies have shown there's more chance for heart attack if you use the snooze button because we have what we call the cortisol awakening response when cortisol should be higher in the morning but it just gets these false starts every time we use the snooze button um making sure we're not having caffeine straight away if we've got problems with sleep give it a good hour hour and a half before we then have caffeine um light exposure in the sun like in, in the daylight rather than sun in this country it's like it's been a bit better for the last week and then suddenly got a bit worse but just being outside in the daylight as much as you can through the day walk when when you can walk rather than taking the car park further away from the shop when when like you're getting the shopping and stuff like so many little things that we can all do but we have to recognize that We've all got to eat. We need to eat, right? We, we need to eat. We need to have fuel. And making those better choices. They don't have to be perfect choices. They can be better choices. And I've been the worst person over the years of being so obsessed with food. As I said, with disordered eating when I competed. I get a little bit more protein in. And whilst there's much better options than a protein bar, the protein bar would be a better option than a full-on chocolate bar. So it may or, not be or nothing at all, you yeah. know, or yeah. nothing at all. A lot of people, oh no, I, I won't, I won't have the protein bar. But I, I did a similar thing years ago, and um, so I had behind me, literally, so I could turn around on my desk and grab it. I had protein waters, I had protein shakes in my office. Still, I have protein bars, so that if I need to grab something, at least I'm grabbing something that's helping me optimize a little bit more. Yeah. towards my goals and I, I i also think that that's the same at home you know having having some stuff that's there so that you can make those decisions when you do need to you've got something that there that's a little bit better even yeah. in, in more recent years rather than order a, a takeaway pizza i'm like oh, i'm gonna order a takeaway turkish you know because the yeah. turkish having some quality chicken and a bit of rice and a bit of salads better than having a, a Domino's pizza or whatever. Yeah. Um, some people might argue, maybe not so, but even that, that was interesting when I was tracking macros a, a couple of months ago, that just by cutting down the amount of rice by half, cutting down the amount of bulgur wheat by half, cutting down the amount of the bread, the Turkish bread, I love Turkish bread, but rather than having everything that they give you you know just having one or two pieces yeah. all of a sudden you're saving six or eight hundred calories you know those yeah. those types of things so most of the times when we say we're hungry we're not hungry at all but it's interesting um that the show is now north star conversations because last march i actually found god i'm not going to a preach or anything like that i started going to church just out of the blue and i've been going since which is like ridiculously changed my life but i don't talk to the staff at our church um a couple of weeks ago and we talk about temptation, right? And actually in the Lord's Prayer, it says, lead us not into temptation. People actually pray to God not to lead them into temptation. But I always say, who's buying the food that you're putting into your house? That you're the one leading yourself into temptation and then praying to God to not lead you into temptation. I think that's a big amount of awareness of that when we go shopping, but We've, we've all been there where we've wanted something so much we've then ordered it in. It's easy to order Uber or Deliveroo or whatever it is nowadays. It's easy. But at least don't have it there and make it so convenient that you, you can like, eat it without even thinking about it. And even more so, the more I speak with parents and becoming a parent myself is that I want to be that role model to my kids. And I see it, like, I see parents saying, why doesn't my son or daughter, why don't they eat vegetables? Well, do you eat vegetables? No, they're looking at you to be that role model. So think about what would you be happy with consistently, or your kids consistently having you to see you eat, to see your behaviors. And that that kind of was, was a kick in the balls when, like for myself, when I was thinking about what kind of a dad do I want to be? Is that little things where we justify it we can actually improve in and mm. it helps a lot of people that mm. what's one thing that i haven't asked you that i should have asked you now you got me put me on the spot with that one um 
I'm not actually sure, to be honest. Like that we've asked quite a few questions. And um, as I said, like I used to be so worried about talking about the hormone stuff, but I feel that it's such a mission. It's part of my my story that I have to tell more people because people can recognize what's going on and look to improve things. So um yeah, I feel feel that you've asked quite a good good amount of things. And if people have a question as well and they they we haven't answered it, then drop me a message and I'll answer it. Well, that brings me on to my next thing, because there'll be people listening to this going, do you know what? Wow. Yeah, I, I am at that place now. I do want to make some changes. I've been struggling with some of these symptoms. Let's let's just do this. Let's just get it done. You know, rather than rather than find themselves going into the minefield of trying to learn it themselves. Um, so if people want to find out more about you, how they can work with you, obviously you're, you've got a wealth of experience in this. You've helped people all over the world from Taylor Swift's manager to hundreds and hundreds of celebrities other athletes that, yeah. all, 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 all throughout. Um, how can people connect with you? Um, where can they find out more? So on Instagram, it's Ollie Matthews health. So Ollie with an IE, um, the website is OJ health, O J A Y health.com. Uh, so you can drop me messages there on Facebook as well. Ollie Jordan Matthews, like, uh, drop me a message on there. And I think like, just one thing is that health should be personalized. As we said, I think that's what we've said about the RDA side of things. And it's that we can Google all this sort of stuff. Chat GPT is amazing for, for even looking at it, like use the tools ahead, but health should be personalized specifically to you. So if people need support for that health, drop me a message and let's just chat. And if it's not full on coaching that people need and there's just a question, just drop me a message. I'm, I'm here to help. Sounds good. Well, Ollie, thank you so much for coming back on the show. And a reminder for everyone, if you found this interesting, go back and listen to episode 119 when I originally had Ollie as a uh, guest on the show. And who knows, Ollie, a couple of years' time, maybe back for the third time for the for the hat trick and, and be great to hear about what's been going on and what's been happening since. So, yeah, guys, go and connect with Ollie. We'll put all of his information in the show notes. Um, Ollie, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And for everyone that's been listening, until next time, live a life you love. Thank you for listening to Northstar Conversations with Will Polston. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Share it with just one person that you think will benefit from it. My North Star is to empower people to transform excuses into results and live a life they love. And this show exists for that purpose. And you can help make that a reality too. By liking, rating, reviewing and sharing the show, you will help the platform algorithms do their thing and get North Star Conversations in front of more people so they can benefit from it too. Make sure you hit subscribe so you get the newest episodes as soon as they're released. Until next time, live a life you love.